Greetings folks, Professor Fiore here. Today we're going to talk about JFET common drain lag network analysis. In other words, a voltage follower like this. Two things we're going to look at today specifically. The first one is how do you deal with a load capacitance? I've thrown this in over here. Load capacitances can be pretty high in some circuits. Um, you might have a big coil of, of wire, for example, you know, a big chunk of wire you have to run. Or it just might be the thing that you're driving might have a very high input capacitance. I'm thinking of maybe, you know, a, a power MOSFET, something like that. So how do we deal with that? The second thing is we're going to look at sort of a shortcut that I've developed, an easier way than the normal, typical way of analyzing a circuit like this. Because as you'll see, a certain kind of interesting kind of sort of problem arises that didn't arise when we looked at, um, you know, a common source amplifier or a common gate amplifier. So let's just walk through this real quick. Um, we have a self-bias configuration here. As a matter of fact, uh, using the values that we have, 54, 58, and a 2K uh, for the source resistor, We've used this configuration before when we looked at um, some of the other JFET high and low frequency analysis um, issues in other videos. So you might want to haul those up, take a look at those um, if you haven't already, just to get an idea of, of the basic run. But primarily, I want to just run through this and see what's what's happening new, right? So what we found in the bat in the in the past was. Um, we had a GM, a transconductance of about 1.35 millisiemens. In this particular case, we know we're going to need the AC source resistance over here. These two in parallel, RS and our load, 1.71K. And you can find the gain from that, right? The midband gain for that would be GMRS over 1 plus GMRS. So plug in your values. You'll get about 0.7, which is around minus 3 dB, right? So whatever we have for the input signal, we expect about 70% of that at the output, again, in the midband. The question is, how far up does this go, right? How far up in frequency before this thing drops off? We've already looked at the low frequency analysis of this, the lead networks, you know, with C in and C out over here. So now it's time to look at the high frequency analysis. All right, we can get out a data sheet and that will indicate that the reverse transfer capacitance, the um, CRSS, which is basically equal to C drain gate, is typically three picofarads for this particular FET. And the input capacitance, which is essentially the combination of that other capacitance that I just mentioned, and the gate source capacitance, um, they're saying that's typically four and a half picofarads. So when you subtract off this piece of it, you end up with three picofarads, right? So we basically have a CGS of three picofarads and a CDG of one and a half picofarads. Now let's take a look at that when we simplify, right? So when we simplify, the coupling caps get shorted out, power supply goes to ground, right? We replace it with its ideal internal resistance, so that's a short. Um, what do we end up with? Well, we end up with at least part of it, this. So we take the two um, resistors down on the source, combine them, we get 1.7K roughly. But you know, if you take a quick look at this, you realize something interesting. And that is that drain gate, as it goes back to the drain, right? This capacitor goes back to the drain. The drain is at ground, which means you could flip this into this drawing here, right? Drain gate, it's, it's on the gate and it's going to ground. So this is just a different way of drawing it. But what's important about this new way of drawing it is that you can see very clearly that C drain gate and CGS, right, the gate source capacitance, these things are not in parallel anymore. You know, you have a resistance now from the source of the FET to ground. If that wasn't there, you know, if we were doing a common source amplifier, hey, no problem. These things just wind up in parallel but not so anymore. We have a more complicated situation going on here. What do you do? Can I just add these together? Well, you could. Depending on the values, you might be close to reality. You might not. Well, what happens if we tear this apart and, um, you know, 
throw a good model of the transistor in here, of the FET, and see what we really have for the circuit, right, when we get all done. Well, we get something like this. Uh-oh. So let's take a look on this side. I've redrawn it on the right-hand side. But here's that gate biasing resistor, the generator resistance. And I've just split out everything down here in the source, right? Biasing resistor, load resistor, and C load. And here is the model for the transistor. So I'll just go through this real quick, right? We have our uh, controlled current source, right? GMVGS is the value of ID. The is the, there's the resistance associated with that current source, which very often is high enough to ignore, calling that RDS. A similar resistance that we have between gate source and importantly, the C gate source capacitance, CGS, and then the capacitance that goes from gate to drain, drain to gate, CDG, is right here. All right, now again, the drain is at ground, so I can redraw this a little bit. So I'm gonna take the CDG, which goes to ground, and I'm gonna draw that out here. So here we go, and the new diagram. Similarly, the current source and its associated internal impedance, they can be flipped and drawn down to ground. So we wind up with this, right? This is our completed circuit. This is what we would have to analyze to do a proper, accurate lag analysis on the circuit. Well, this is a little, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's a little cranky compared to this, the schemes we've been looking at before. You know, for starters, we have a controlled current source. Well, this controlled current source, the controlling element is VGS. Where's VGS? It's right here, gate source. Well, guess what? This current actually sets up or helps to set up the source voltage. But this voltage right across here, our load voltage, plus VGS is fixed to whatever V generator is, right? This input divides. You can almost think of this as a voltage divider. It's not really a divider because you've got a current source in here, but you understand right from KVL that this potential plus this potential has to add up to VGen. And this potential is what sets the current and the current is what sets up this voltage here, right? The load voltage. So you have this interesting sort of um, interdependence going on here. And in the, um, in the AC circuit analysis text, you know, we've seen circuits like this. And you know, with a dependent source, we would probably solve this with mesh analysis at a, uh, s a single frequency or more likely a nodal analysis. I happen to be a nodal aficionado, so I would probably use nodal on this. But nonetheless, however you, however you uh, approach this, right, that's the way you would go about it. Now, that's appropriate for single frequency. If you want to do, you know, a, a frequency response, you'd probably use a more advanced technique like a, um, a Laplace S-domain technique. But again, I want to keep this kind of simple along the lines of what we did in the other circuits. Maybe there's an approximation we can use, right? Well, there are a couple things you can do. First of all, if C drain gate is a lot bigger than CGS, my recommendation would be just use that as your approximation. In other words, you can see right here, this is a lag network. Let's just ignore this bit of it, okay? Um, typically, our gen is gonna be a lot smaller than the biasing resistor on the gate, RG. So this is gonna come back to just our gen and our gen and CDG will set up the input critical frequency. And then over here, Right, usually RDS is big enough to ignore, and we have just RS and our, um, our load with C load, and that'll set up our other one. Obviously, the lowest of the two is going to be the dominant network, and you know, off we go. Nothing, nothing really new. There will obviously be some variation on that because you know we are literally ignoring the um, gate source elements over here. Well, what else can you do, right? I mean, you know, what if, what if you don't have that case? Hmm, well, like I said, I've, I've come up with a little equivalent that will work, kind of, sort of. So here's what we do. On the front end, and this is using the original values in the, in the circuit, right? Here's my R gen, gate resistor, R in gate. I'm just throwing in one, one giga ohm here, but, you know, it's going to be huge, right? It's 10 to the huge. That's what it is. So... This is just going to fall back to 2 meg, and then we're going to put that in parallel with the R gen to get the input. 
On the output, there's the two resistors. You know, I've ignored RDS. I'm assuming it's big enough to ignore, right? So we got the 2K and the 12K for RS and our load, and then our C load. So that's kind of what I just explained. The interesting bit is up front, and that's what I've called C in lag. What is this? And the approximation is going to be, well, it's CDG, quote unquote, scare quotes, plus some of CGS. Well, how much? All right. If you ignore this second piece, then that's the first approximation I was talking about, where I was just saying, yeah, well, you know, CDG is way bigger than CGS, so we just run with that. Well, you know, if you don't have that situation, and in our case, we don't, because CDG over here is one and a half picofarads, and the CGS we're going to use is three picofarads. So the sum of CGS, right, the part of CGS, the rule of thumb I, I use is CGS divided by the quantity GMRS. Where does this come from? Basically, it's the ratio of 1 over GM to RS. That's what that ratio is. So the total capacitance is going to be CDG plus this piece, CGS divided by GMRS, which in our case, the GM is 1.35 millisiemens and RS is 1.7K. So when you uh, apply that, right, we get a total of 2.8 picofarads, right? So this piece comes out to 1.3 pico. Continuing along, the input impedance, like, way, like I said, was 2 mag in parallel with, you know, huge Amundo over here. So basically 2 mag, put that in parallel with your generator, which is 5K, as we typically would do in these sorts of analyses. So we've got an in lag of 5K. Now, if I was just going to use the the approximation of well you know i'll ignore cgs i'll just use cdg we would use 1.5 picofarads with that 5k and we would get 21.2 megahertz all right so i just want to show you how this is going to improve our odds if i use the rule of thumb in other words the 2.8 picofarads and you calculate with the 5k you get 11.4 megahertz instead now on the output end the uh, lag capacitance we see out here is just a load of one nanofarad. Now, theoretically, there is a little bit of capacitance. All right, I'm going to go back to a preceding circuit, right? There is some capacitance associated with the drain to source. And, you know, here's the drain to source, right? The drain's going to ground, so that does appear in parallel. That does appear across, um, you know, the load. But that, it's tiny. It's going to be a fraction of a, a picofarad, typically. So since we're talking about a load capacitance of a nanofarad, we can just throw that out, all right? So in any case, the impedance we care about is 2K in parallel with 12K, and the C is 1 nanofarad, right? So we put that all in parallel, right? And, um, you know, like I said, we have the, uh, uh, here it is, the 2 and the 12. We have the 741, which is 1 over 1.35. That's the impedance looking into, I didn't draw it on here, kind of ran out of space, but that's the impedance looking, um, you know, back into the back into the source of the FET. Okay, so one over GM, seven hundred forty-one. Put all those things in parallel. We get five hundred seventeen ohms. So I take the five seventeen and the one nanofarad, and that cranks out the three hundred eight kilohertz. Now clearly, out of those two, right, the three hundred eight kilohertz is dominant. So we would expect this system, the F two, to be at three hundred eight kilohertz, and then it would, you know, as we got up to uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 megahertz, it would start to fall off again, according to our approximation. All righty, so let's go back to the original, right? Just to recap real quick here though, you know, input, output, this is reminiscent of you know, what we did with uh, you know, a common source or even a common gate, all right? Versus analyzing this little beastie, all right? If you want an accurate value, do this. You want to do it fairly quick, right? We're going to do it this other way. Now, let me just pull this up. Oops. Pull this up. So we have our values sitting here. Okay. Um, how close is this going to be? Well, you know, I've, I've worked with this on and off. I've looked at different transistors, but for your typical small signal FET, um, you're probably going to get a value within 10, 15, 20 percent of, of your calculated. In other words, when you simulate this, if you actually built the circuit, right? It's going to be considerably closer than if you just ignored the CGS, 
In any case, let's come in here and do our typical AC transfer. All righty, pull this over here. And we knew we had a gain of around uh, 0.7, right? Which is like minus 3 dB. So what are we getting over here? We're getting minus 3.325. So that looks really good. Now I have to go three decibels below that. So that's going to kick in at 6.325. And we will record that, right? Whenever we get to 6.325. Uh, zoink. Okay, so we're in between, um, let's call it 300 kilohertz for that. All right. Now notice that we are seeing kind of a little bit of a curvature in, in the roll-off. And this is because of the other network kicking in. All right. So far, so good, though. How do we check the... Um, other other network, right? The 11.4. So we we just did 300, 308. We expected this because it's the the output network because it it is the uh, dominant network, right? 308 versus 300. Eh, that's pretty good, you know, a couple percent. All right. Now, what we can do on paper, right? What we can do in the simulator is simply null out that output capacitor. So I'm just going to put zero in for that. So the only capacitance we really have is this, you know, fraction of a picofarad out here on the drain source, which appears out here. So this thing is going to go through the roof, right? This is going to go, you know, many, several orders of magnitude. It's going to be way bigger than our 11.4. So now it's this input network that we've approximated that will be dominant, and we're going to see what we're going to get. So a nice little, a nice little sort of paper trick you can do there. All right, so get our cursor on here. We should still be at about 3. Point, yep, there we are, 3.3. So again, we're going to be looking for uh, a negative 6.3 for our roll-off. A little bit more. Come on, you can do it. 6.3, let's go, come in. Almost, okay, that looks pretty good. So we're getting about 12.5 megahertz for this one. 12 and a half megahertz. And our rule of thumb, our approximation said 11.4. Okay, so we're off by a little over megahertz. We're off by a little over 10%. But, you know, if we had ignored it, if we had just looked at uh, the CDG, the calculation was 21 megahertz. All right, so not perfect, but it is fairly quick. It's fairly easy to do, right? It doesn't take, a, you know, a lot of grinding through on your calculator and so forth. So it's a nice little rule of thumb you can use, put you in the ballpark, and off you go. And after all, let's, let's be honest here. You would never just go through these kinds of calculations or even go through a simulation and get a result and then immediately go into production with it. Right? That would be insane. Only crazy people do that. What you would want to do, of course, is after the simulations and calculations look good, you'd build your prototype, right? Test your prototype, make sure everything works. Then, after you've done that work, you can consider going to production. You would never just go from, uh, at least not in circuits like this, you would never go from, from a uh, paper calculation or a simulation and then immediately go into production, right? Like I said, only crazy people do that. So, I think this little technique, right, with our sort of modified circuit, winds up being a little bit less daunting, a little bit less difficult than analyzing this beastie. I'm not saying this is impossible. I'm not saying you can't do this, right? Um, it's just a little bit more difficult. You know, it's the difference, well, I was going to say, it's the difference between tying your shoes and deciding you're going to mine manganese on the moon. It's not quite that extreme, but, I mean, this is doable, right? You can do this. This one's a little bit easier, right? It's a little bit more straightforward. And we get fairly good results. All right? Okay, beauty. If you have any questions, you know what to do down in the comments. Take care, and we'll see you next time.